Well, welcome everyone, uh, particularly those who are joining one of our events for the first time. Um, for those who are new to the IBE, our purpose is to champion the highest standards of ethical behaviour in business. And um, we do that through a mix of adv advocacy, training, research and thought leadership, but also by convening events and networks to share and promote best practice. Um, today's event will be interactive and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So please type your questions in the Q&A box um, as we go along. Uh, if you have any technical problems, then please use the chat function uh, to get the help that you need. Um, you can enter your questions at any time. Um, we'll make sure that the slides are available to download after the event uh, on our, and uh, we'll also include on our website a, a recording of this event as well. So if there's any colleagues who are unable to make it, you will be able to see this uh, uh, on demand. We will be live tweeting, so please join in the conversation with the hashtag business ethics matters. Now, ethics of diversity is an area that the IBE has been very vocal on. Our recent board briefing followed up on a significant report we published in December on the dangers of groupthink at a board level and what could be done to broaden the range of thinking and life experience at that level. The ethical case for diversity and inclusion is overwhelming. But today's event is to look at a real world example of how a commitment to diversity and inclusion at a board level and senior leadership level translates to better opportunities for everyone in the workplace and better outcomes for customers. But before I introduce our speaker today, I talked about diversity and inclusion as two separate concepts. Um, I'd like us to quickly test everyone else's views with a quick poll on this. So we're gonna put up a number of questions. Let's see the first one. And please can you uh, select the answer which best reflects how comfortable you are with each of these statements. First one, I understand the difference between diversity and inclusion. Thirty-three, fifty-seven, ten, and zero. Okay. Uh, so not entirely clear to everyone. Let's look at the second one. Um, now, the second question: My organisation recognises, values, and promotes diversity. Oh, people feeling quite confident about that. 45, 40, 15, and again, zero. Thank you. Okay, and then the final question, and thank you for your answers. The final question, the same question, but this time on inclusion. My organization recognizes values and promotes inclusion. So please pick the statement that best reflects your comfort level. Thirty-seven, fifty-three, eleven, and zero. Thank you. Well, we may well come back and reflect on those scores a, a, a little later um, in, in the session. But finally, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Sarah Mason. Hello, Sarah, and thank you for Hello. your patience. <laughs> Sarah is Chief People Officer at Foxton's, London's leading estate agent. Um, I think as many of us know, Foxton's has grown from one small office in the early 1980s to over 50 branches, and now includes Alexander Hall, the mortgage broker. It's known for doing things differently, perhaps most notably its fleet of iconic green minis, uh, usually double parked uh, somewhere around the capital. Um, its workforce, uh, though, you know, is why is why we're here today, because its workforce reflects the immense diversity of our capital. Um, and I read on, on your website that you have 61 languages spoken across your workforce, which is really astonishing. 
Sarah joined Foxton's in July 2018 after a background in, in talent, learning and development and HR roles across a number of highly regarded multinationals. Uh, she's a chartered fellow of the CIPD and her qualifications include a psychology degree and a master's in organizational change. And Sarah's gonna give us a little bit of background to the Foxen story, and then we'll open up for Q and A. But remember, please, you can submit your questions at any stage. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you, Mark, thank you for that. So I'm gonna to talk today about Foxton's and our journey from being a diverse employer to being a diverse and inclusive employer. Um, and there was a real shift on that one. So I'm gonna start with a quote, which I think encapsulates this. So could I have the next slide, please? I feel a bit like Chris Whitty asking for slides to be moved on. Thank you very much. So this, there's lots of quotes on, on diversity and inclusion, lots of good ones, but this is one that really lands with where we're at on our Foxton's journey which was diversity is the mix and inclusion is making the mix work. And that really summed up where we were and where we are now. Going back three, four years ago, Foxton's was a diverse uh, employer, we still are. We currently have around 35 to 40% BAME employees, depending on which year you'd looked at. And we're usually around a 50-50 male-female split, currently 53% male, um, really diverse and actually a bit of an outlier in the property industry because the property industry isn't, isn't known for its diversity, but, but we are, we aim to, to reflect the communities that we, we work in in London. So we had diversity, we had plenty of diversity in our organisation, but we had some feedback that we weren't particularly inclusive. Um, and that came in the form of employee engagement um, survey data. And I'm sure most people on the call will be involved in that in some way. Most companies, it's pretty much a given these days, we'll do that annual em employee engagement survey. And whilst I appreciate it's not perfect, it's a bit of a snapshot of a moment in time, it does give us some comparable data to compare two ways, compare cross-sectional data, compare across groups within the same time period, and then longitudinal, compare people across different time periods. And we did both. So going back three or four years ago, we did our cross-sectional comparison of different employee groups. And actually there were real significant differences, statistical differences between the engagement of different groups. And that, not in a good way. We thought actually we've got different groups that are less engaged than the rest of the workforce. So we needed to look at that. And that, that really highlighted, we had diversity kind of covered. We certainly represented the communities that we served in that way, but for whatever reason, that wasn't um, falling into inclusion at all. It didn't follow into inclusion. We were having groups in our workforce that, was, that perceived that we were, they were less able to succeed in Foxton's and they weren't as engaged as other people. So we had to look at that. So if I can move on to my next slide, please. Before we jumped into, which is very tempting, we jumped into, right, let's, let's sort it out. Let's go into solution mode. We thought, let's just pause and really figure out what, what we need to do and where we are before we jump into to action. So we, we, we held back a little bit. And we, we looked at that data I mentioned. So we started off with that data and I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. Then that data really shone a light on where we needed to go to next. And only then did we start planning action. We planned action with, with, with our workforce. It wasn't an HR initiative done by HR, you know, literally no one else got involved. It was very much, it was a business, it was a business issue, not an HR issue. And we, we wanted everyone involved in it. Um, then obviously really key, most business talks will have metrics in there somewhere. It was about monitoring, reviewing, evaluating progress along the way and the impact we had. And that last point's really important. We didn't kind of get to the end of it and gone, brilliant, we're now inclusive, we can stop now, that's great. It was this continuous piece, how do we loop round so we're continuing to listen, act and review. So that was the approach we took and it, it kind of, there was lots of moving parts to it. So what I want to do in the 20 minutes I've got before we take questions is to go through each of these stages. And I'm sure a lot of you will be in companies doing bits of this already, if not all of it, but it's hopefully we'll, we'll give some useful tips for those who aren't. So if I can have the, the next slide, please. So gathering data, I'm a bit of a, um, a geek when it comes to data with my psychology background. I absolutely love to have a look at data. And we looked at both quantitative 
kind of numerical and qualitative anecdotal data here. It was really important to do both. Um, so lots of quantitative data around the demographic breakup. And when I, by the way, I should have referenced up front, I'm going to use the um, terminology BAME throughout. I appreciate it's a very reductive expression and the government has said we really need a better a better word or ter terminology than BAME, but they still haven't suggested an alternative. So, and I'm, I think it's the most well-known and widely accepted term, so I will use it, but I'm gonna put a disclaimer that I appreciate it's not a perfect um, expression to use. So we looked at demographic and organizational data up front. What was the makeup of organization in terms of diversity? And how did that look at different levels? Really important, so lots of quantitative data there. Lots of quantitative data in our, our engagement survey. Like I said, we looked at it two ways, cross-sectionally, across different groups in the same time period. And then that period of ongoing continual review, we looked at the longitudinal data. Over periods of time, we'll be moving on. So we looked at this group in this year, we could then look at future years and see the progress and match it, which was great. So we looked at both cross-sectional and longitudinal data so we could compare groups, but also compare progress over time. Um, and really a lot of that engagement survey data told us where to look. It certainly wasn't on its own enough. We then, as a result, had to hold focus groups. So it told us, for instance, engagement surveys are great at having a snapshot, point of time, lots of people covered, but that's kind of where it ends. We actually have a really high response rate to our engagement survey. We, The last one we did, 89% of our, our workforce um, responded. So it gives us a full picture, but unfortunately it's limited to 12 to 15 questions with a Likert scale. So we needed a bit more richness of data. So that's when we got the focus groups involved. We looked at the groups that were less engaged. We've got independent focus groups, independent facilitators in, some experts in. So it felt that it was impartial and neutral. And then we could drill down into the reasons why certain groups felt less engaged. Was it about promotion? Was it about fairness? Was it about reward? And drill into all those areas. And then that then helped us know what, what we were facing, what we needed to do. We also did benchmark it um, inside and outside our industries. It's useful to look at that, but very much focused on London. We are London-based estate agent, so we need to reflect those communities. So we always looked at London statistics. And then we also looked at other relevant research. The CIPD publishes lots of information and research on diversity and inclusion. So we, we looked at that to make sure that we were mirroring best, best practice and learning from other organisations, because lots of companies do some great stuff and we didn't need to reinvent the wheel too much there. If I can have the next slide, please. So in terms of what we did next, so we've kind of got our data, we know what we need to look at. We took a number of actions and like most companies, we started off with communities and networks. Um, and we currently have three, we built them over time. Our women at Foxton's group for female employees. Afro Foxton's is for black employees and our Foxton's LGBTQ plus network. And they've all kind of been built. And as you'll see from my second point there, they, they are headed up by very, very senior leaders in our business. So we've got a couple of MDs and a chief operating officer running those communities and they're active members of those communities as well. And that, that means a number of things get done. First of all, senior people can make decisions quickly. They can get budget, they can get resource, they can allocate resource quickly. So it meant that we could marshal our troops super quick by getting senior people leading those communities. And by being active members of those communities, it meant their communities were very, very happy to go and speak to them with any issues encouraged lots of upwards feedback and things got done. So that worked brilliantly, having those. We also set up some mentoring groups as well. We, as an estate agent, have lots of different offices scattered around London. So you can imagine pockets of people maybe feeling a bit isolated. Having a network where they all, all, all join up is very useful. And it was particularly useful for our women at Foxton's network. So with our estate agents, our female estate agents would all get together in smaller groups, mentoring breakfast, and that worked really well. Funny enough, during the pandemic, we had to change that because can't all gather for breakfast at that point. So we then switched to partner with Albright. Um, I don't know if, if you all know about it, a membership club for women. They've got a brilliant digital platform that has networking with lots of women, it has really good virtual events, lots of content, brilliant content that's career enhancing. So all our female uh, managers had access to that during the pandemic because obviously they couldn't all get together in the way they could previously. And we built program, programs of events. Again, lots of companies do this, lots of active involvement with 
our communities, but also building a huge ally base. And Foxtons as a culture, we're pretty open, we all get on really well, um, and allyship was a big key part of our programmes. So our events are often full of allies as well as community members, and that was really important to us. Inclusiveness has to be for everyone. We didn't want our communities to feel like closed groups, and that's worked brilliantly. So I can have the next slide, but onto the events. So here are some of the pictures of our events. We've done some really good ones. Um, again, the events were bespoke to the community and we continue to do them digitally, actually. Um, very, very bespoke, depending on the community, what they felt was important. International Women's Day is always a theme. Um, we did Black History Month, obviously, the Afro Foxtons groups. We did also a really interesting one around wine tasting from black wine producers that went down really well. And LGBTQ+, they have lots of speakers, digital or in person, but the big event is we sponsor Pride, and we, we walk in the, in the Pride Parade in London. I don't know if you can see from that photo, there's a, there's a teenage girl there with a pink cowboy hat. That's in fact my daughter. She was delighted to join us. We all, always have our allies joining us as well as the community members for the Pride March. And she was very happy to hold the Foxton sign. She wouldn't let anyone else hold it actually. It was kind of her thing. And we did, we, we brought kids along to the Pride March. Again, it was, it was signaling our intent as a leadership team. This is important to you, it's important to us. Let's let's make, make sure everyone realizes that we're an inclusive employer. We want it open to everyone. So Pride was a great event for our LGBTQ plus colleagues and allies, and we're doing it again in September. We actually had a recruitment stall in Soho as well at the time with a stall set up, giving out rainbow tattoos, talking about careers at Foxton's and hiring more diverse talent into the organization. So we kind of approached it twofold. So there were some of the, the, the events we've done, they've gone down brilliantly and we've shifted to more digital events. I should just say those photos are of a time when we could meet in person. We're definitely not breaching any regulations now. We're um, obviously doing digital events right now until we can all gather again. If I can have the next slide, please. So this is kind of a bit of an obvious point and I'm sure most of you will think your organizations listen, but it's sometimes e easier said than done. Active listening was a really big part of being inclusive. Um, and sometimes you have to be open to hearing things you might not want to hear, negative feedback, for instance, or things that aren't working well. Having those leaders in place, chairing the committees who are very senior, worked really well. Upwards feedback was very, um, very much prevalent. We still have lots of it. Um, and continuous feedback from our mentoring groups as well. So we actually ended up in a position, which we we're very happy with, of really not having, not having to struggle to get feedback. People were very, very comfortable giving pick feedback upwards and letting us know what we needed to work on. Worked really well. We're lucky. We already have a very open kind of informal culture. Um, but we have, for lots of reasons, we hire lots of, you know, salespeople who are very gregarious and social and extrovert. So everyone tends to have an opinion and they're happy to share it and that works for us. But it meant that feedback, people weren't slow to give it and we could then work with it, which was really useful. We set up our workforce council a couple of years ago. That meets quarterly and one of our non-exec directors chairs it. They rotate actually each quarter a different non-exec director chairs that meeting and it means they get exposure to lots of viewpoints of our employees. Um, we make sure that Workforce Council has all of our communities represented, and we also have a regular slots to talk about DNI issues. So they're always at the forefront there for discussion with senior people, really important. Yeah, and finally, we continued with those engagement surveys. We continue to do so. They provide us with really good benchmarking and a way of capturing a lot of feedback very quickly. So active listening was really important. And from that, then we could look at how we support and develop our workforce. So can I have the next slide on that, please? We mentioned the programme of events, they've been really popular and again very bespoke. What we've been pleased to see there is actually we've been pleased to see that lots of allies join those events. So like I say, they are inclusive and open. So the events digital now have been very popular because actually some of the allies come along and learn things they weren't aware of and it builds this more inclusive environment. It shouldn't just be for those communities because then you've got a whole group of people who feel they're shut out a little bit and also aren't learning so our events are open to everyone. We recently actually had a great speaker for our Women at Foxton's talk, Martin Wright who's a Paralympian talks about resilience and it was open to obviously men and women and we had a really big turnout for it, really important to have open events for all. And those mentoring groups, again, drove development, 
peer learning kicked in, people could share best practice and ideas and that worked well. I've already mentioned this, this targeted recruitment that we did at Pride. We were always looking for ways of hiring diverse talent. It's a little bit chicken and egg, isn't it? It's really hard to hire diverse talent unless you're seen as a diverse employer, but because we are, it means we can continue to hire diverse talent in. So that's been super important to us. Sponsorship was a key theme. Mentoring is useful to a point, but when it comes to getting people promoted, sponsorship tends to be a bit more effective, we felt. So particularly in our Afro Foxtons group, we had all the high potentials all kind of mapped out. Where is the talent that the next, the next future leaders coming from to make sure they all had very targeted and rapid career plans planned for them? We weren't, we weren't kind of missing out on anyone. And that, that saw a number of promotions come through, which was great. Um, I wanted to mention policies. It wouldn't really be a talk about HR without a policy. Sorry about that. And policies, whilst most people don't like red tape, they do like getting things done and a good policy should get things done. And where policies fitted in here was around things like shared parental leave um, and flexibility. So shifting our policies to be more family friendly was a big part of being inclusive to our female employees. Very, very important. We took the move a few years back to, mention, to make sure that our shared parental leave um, was the same as our enhanced maternity leave. And our enhanced maternity leave is pretty generous. Depending on your tenure, it can be anywhere from 12 to 26 weeks full pay and up to 13 weeks half pay, but that's open for shared parental leave for men as well as women. And that's been obviously a difference in lots of companies. Shared parental leave is often much less than enhanced maternity pay. So we looked at how do we make the shared parental pay as equal to the maternity pay so men can take up some of those duties if they've if they feel they should. So that was important. Again, it signaled intent. We're looking to be family friendly for everyone. It's quite important. And finally, this, this piece around allyship. Again, Foxton's as a group of employees are very social. People love their Foxton's family, as we call it. And that, that wasn't too difficult, actually. People were happy to get on board and, and join their communities and get to know them better. So if I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. I wanted to talk about some of the ways we measured progress. Um, because you've got to be able to be quite um, clinical about it, not just pat yourself on the back and say, yeah, yeah, everyone's having a great time. We've had some amazing events. Isn't this fun? You usually get great feedback after events because people hopefully have enjoyed them, but we wanted to really drill into a bit more than that. So we've mentioned engagement scores, this continuous measurement around cross-sectional data across groups, longitudinal data across years. Are we seeing it increasing? Are we not? And actually last, um, our last survey was in December. I was really pleased to see for the first year, we had absolutely no statistical difference or significant difference between the communities at all and the average Foxen's engagement score. And actually our engagement score was pretty high. We measure uh, five questions on engagement on a, a Likert scale of agree and disagree. We normally have um, between 83 and 84% engagement on that's really high. Um, and we have a high response rate. So we had 89% responding. So we've lots of people with a very high engagement score. And the missing piece that happened last year was it wasn't just high for a few people, it was high for a lot of people across all communities. So that was really good. And we did our engagement score, by the way, in our engagement survey in December last year, right at the kind of end of a very challenging year. So we're pleased to see that it stayed high despite the pandemic and all communities felt that they were looked after. It's good. Um, we've increased the percentage of senior female leaders in our organisation, which is obviously a key theme for lots of businesses. These communities we mentioned, we saw more people getting involved in them, which showed us there was a desire to get involved, a desire to be part of these communities. And then that just builds and builds, which has been fantastic. In terms of our customers, there's a very obvious link between um, diversity internally and externally. Customers like doing business with people like them. We want to represent, like I say, the communities we serve. And we noticed, obviously, we, we do want to work with those customer bases so they can see that we're a diverse employer. Small things have made a difference. Our LGBTQ plus network have made sure that any um, documents we have around contracts now is going to become um, trans friendly in terms of the language we use, particularly around name checking for property, which is quite important when it comes to money laundering regulation. We need to be very tight on compliance, but we want to be inclusive and also having gender neutral toilets in all our branches for customers and, and employees has been key. So some of the changes, having our communities making suggestions impact on our customers, all driven from our communities, not from HR. 
Then finally, this piece on external recognition, we wanted to measure up how we were doing. We, we won an award last year in the Business Culture Awards. We've just been shortlisted on the CIPD's Best Diversity and Inclusion category, which is great. And it's not because we want badges, just we're just very keen to make sure that we can showcase that we're diverse so we can continue to attract diverse talent. It's really important. Diverse talent will go to where they feel included. We want to make sure we're offering those great opportunities to everyone. So next slide, please. I just want to spend some time before we start wrapping up for questions. Lessons learned was an interesting one. Um, it's always sometimes a tricky topic, DNI, because people can feel awkward about it. And so my first point there, diversity is diverse. By the very nature, it's a bit messy. It's impossible to categorise everyone. You can't. So even having communities can sometimes feel very reductive. What works for one person within that community doesn't work for someone else. Some people absolutely love International Women's Day and other people hate it because they find it really reductive and it should be every day. The same with Black History Month. Some of our Afro Foxton's community love it because it's an opportunity to share and learn. Other people don't because they find it should be something that's continuous, not, not just one month. Um, and you have to be comfortable with that. You have to be comfortable with that with that difference, that diversity, and say, we, we can't do one thing that's going to keep everyone happy, but that doesn't stop us from trying to have a really great dialogue between people to say, what's working, what's not, how do we, how do we get the, the balance right? So it can be uncomfortable, messy, and difficult, but it shouldn't stop people from going, that's fine, we are still going to do some great things. So we, we, learn, our, we learn our lesson on that one. That second point about listening and talking, it sometimes tempting to jump in to say look how much great stuff we're doing and actually that's the wrong the wrong thing that the right thing is to say you tell us what's great you tell us what's not I'm sure we haven't got everything right and listening was a really important part and sometimes people are so quick to jump in with an opinion we've got to give people space to have that dialogue which was really important to us this piece around easy answers it's a tricky one. There aren't always easy answers with diversity. We had some divisions, for instance, where we had more male senior management than female. And that's kind of tricky because we've got some very experienced managers there who aren't looking to leave and there aren't any vacancies. So the challenge around how do we get the balance right? And obviously there's, there's ways of doing it. You look at other divisions where there are vacancies and you look at and making sure that you've got a really fair recruitment process, but things aren't always quick or easy to solve. Um, also, we have a very long hours culture, you know, our customers like to transact between 6 to 8 p.m. in the evening and on Saturdays, it's when people like to go and view properties, and that doesn't always fit in with childcare, so we had to be mindful of some of these, these tricky issues and still try and navigate them and not just say it's too hard, let's not bother, you just have to get immersed in it a little bit. And then finally, this piece I've mentioned a few times, having culture of upwards feedback. Like I say, we're quite an informal culture, not too hierarchical, so people are really happy to, to give that feedback. Sometimes our senior managers have to remind themselves that if they ask for opinion, they have to listen to what's said. It's really key. But having that upward, upwards feedback meant that we got things done much quicker and we could understand things very early on. So one last slide before questions, but another last slide first, please, which is continuing on how we build on our journey. I still think we've got a fair bit of work to do, particularly around disability. We haven't looked at accessibility yet across our businesses in a way that we'd like to. Um, we're really, really big on social mobility and youth, and we've recently been partnering with the youth group to, to become youth verified. Um, and the reason for that is actually Foxton's are known for having lots of young staff. Um, we do actually hire lots of young people. We hire lots of entry level people and train them up to become great estate agents. And that's really good for social mobility, particularly when actually we have a large proportion of our joiners not necessarily having a degree. We don't insist on degree qualifications. Social mobility is really important to us. So we're working more on that. And we've just partnered with Career Ready to plan some internships and some mentoring and some programmes for that to really you know, harness the work we've been doing on social mobility and youth. Um, so I think we've got still a lot, of, a lot of work to do, but it sounds like an exciting next three years for us, I think. And I think then that really wraps us up ready to take some Q&A. So if I can have the next slide. Mark, I guess I hand back to you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. You covered a, a quite extraordinary amount of ground uh, um, there. So I suspect most of the questions that that we're going to, you know, we're going to be covering. You've, you know, you've, um, you've at least framed during the uh, during your intro. So thank you for uh, for taking us through such a a, a broad range of aspects of this. Um, as a reminder, yes, please put your questions in the Q and A box. Perhaps I can link 
uh, a question from from Don, from from Donnelly. Hello, Donnelly. To uh, a question that uh, was submitted in advance of this, and it's you know it's a, it's a, it's around budgeting, resourcing, and you know we normally see with our ethics programs that um, you know the 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 best uh, it, it normally takes some sort of um, burning platform or bad experience before there's a serious investment in this. So how do you create the investment in the first place? What are the sort of you know what would be your tips for, for others to do this. And then, you know, secondly, when there's a big distraction like we've all had over the last year and a half, and there are other things which are, which are uh, you know, many people see as more immediate and urgent priorities, how do you maintain focus on a, on a program once you've got it going? Okay, so I'll take that first one, one around, around budget. Um, most companies will have a CSR budget. And this kind of sometimes comes under that category. So some of the work we're doing under things like Career Ready and the Youth Group fall under CSR as a PLC, you know, report on CSR. So some budget's easier to access. So I think you've got this element of formal budget, the stuff that comes under some corporate programs, which is kind of easy to access. If it falls under CSR, normally it's easy to get your hands on some budget there because companies want to be, to be seen to be investing in their CSR programs. Um, and the other bit is around informal budget, which is sometimes opportunities wouldn't be planned for because we've encouraged our, communi our community to come up with ideas. So it would be unplanned. They'd go, actually, I'm, I'm a member of this community and I'd like to do this, you know, and that would happen really regularly. Um, and we had to be okay with that. So we kind of knew we wanted to have some money spent ready for events, for networking. So we planned all that. We planned to have a pot of money, but then it, as to how it got allocated, it came up through our community members and they put forward a case for it very informally, there was no kind of presentation or business case document. They'd kind of go to their community chair and say, how about we do X, Y, and Z? And they go, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's put it to the rest of the community and see if that's what we want to go for. Thank you. I mean, I suppose a related point is, you know, you're, you're fortunate in many ways that you have some committed leaders in your, your organization, you know, Nick, Patrick, Dom, and others who, who have, you know, very clearly and very, very visibly set the right tone from the top. Not, 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 not everyone is fortunate in, in having that. You know, how, how would you encourage others who are, who, who are struggling and how do you sort of surface these, you know, these role, role models? It's a really, it's a really difficult one. Um, I think the, the number one driving force for getting stuff done so easily and quickly for us was having senior level sponsorship. I think it would be an unreal uphill struggle did, had we not had the senior team on board. Um, and that's that's a big chestnut of a question, isn't it? How do you get senior leaders to buy into something that they don't really agree with? If I'm honest, and it's a bit of a cheeky answer. I learned very early on in my career, the best way to get a senior leader to do anything is, is make them believe it's their idea. So that's usually in point number one, if you can get them to come up with it themselves, they're more likely to throw their weight behind it. And secondly, use of data. If, if there's data that can demonstrate, and it's a bit brutal, you shouldn't need to, it should simply be about doing the right thing. It kind of pains me to even say this point, but for those people who need a bit more encouragement to do the right thing, data to demonstrate a business case, lots of businesses have data that shows that the more diversity is correlated to performance. There's no causal relationship that's been demonstrated just yet, because that's quite hard to do. There's plenty of correlations around, around diversity and inclusion, and business performance, as well as brand. You know, on LinkedIn, you can see companies all about promoting their brand ethically. So yeah, you might have a few few dinosaurs. Either there's a there's a you know a chunky business case to put forward around business benefit, or there's making it their idea, or simply tugging on the you know their the kind of hearts and minds a little bit to say, come on, you know this is this isn't shouldn't even be a conversation. This is quite obvious. Does that make sense? Yep. Um. You know, you mentioned as, as you went through one of the sort of challenges of, um, you know, reductionism here, and, and uh, you know, the obvious point that individuals are endlessly varied, uh, and uh, not many of us are, are defined only by one aspect of a range of characteristics which we could be categorised by. So, um, you know, how how do you ensure that? You know, you talked a little bit about this, but how do you ensure that all your inclusion efforts are intersectional and, and um, you know, using those networks to build bridges and, 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 and allyship, um, the, the, 
you know, if you've got some more examples of anything innovative you've done in that space, that would be really helpful. Yeah, it's a challenge. I think, first of all, that kind of kind of question there around how do you handle differences within your communities? And the one example I'll use there is women at Foxton's. I was kind of, again, wince a little bit when people refer it to a minority group, because I have to remind people that women make up half the population. It's quite quite a big group, quite a big group of people. And in Foxton's, it's roughly half our workforce. So it's not some kind of small group of people. It's a chunky big group of people, which sometimes makes events difficult because you've got a big group of people wanting to attend them. And that's why virtual events have been more useful, actually. How do we handle difference there has been interesting there's often the temptation for um, that, that community to go for flexibility and, and impact of parenting on career. But we've got lots of female employees that don't have kids and aren't interested in having kids. And that's not of interest in them at all in any way. So we have to go, well, how do we make that work? And that's why the Albright platform was picked. It's all about career enhancing content, very positive, very aspirational. They've got great um, courses you can do about your personal brand, as opposed to it's all about flexibility and parenting. So it's making sure that we've got options, flexible working practices and policies for those who have got kids, but also options for those that haven't. So it's being quite broad with it and not trying to do the one size fits all, because it definitely doesn't work in these communities. It really doesn't at, at all. Um, and then that second point was around allyship building allyship across communities. Again, people's communities support the other ones. So actually at the women's events, we'll often have lots of people from the two other communities come along and it's almost become a done thing now. The communities are used to talking to each other because they're, because they're run by our community members. They're often asking for ideas for their events. So there's been quite a lot of interaction between the communities and the chairs sharing ideas. That's happened quite organically. It wasn't something we stepped in on. It just automatically happened. And there's some interesting, you know, some of the themes that you've, you, you've, that you've talked about, um, you know, allyship across the, across the organisation, you know, greater learning and understanding, um, um, you know, move towards sort of co-creation of, 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 of policy and, and stuff like that. You know, these are all things that, um, you know, I'd be interested to hear how, how they've, um, you know, perhaps less so about how they've been, how they've been, um, uh, led by the values of the organization but more the you know more the reverse how has this experience influenced the, va the values and the culture of the organization more broadly i think that that piece for me around when you have an event happen a critical moment or an issue how you handle it demonstrates your values quite clearly so what we shouldn't do is have a dni talk where i say everything's rosy and great it's not it's really difficult sometimes and we get things wrong very early on when we set up the afro foxton's group um our dom our chair went and asked our communities for their feedback and he got three bits of feedback were really interesting one was that they're really happy and engaged it's great they like working here fantastic secondly they felt there was underrepresentation at management level so great we can work on that and the third point was one kind of horrified to hear about but we had to go let's let's fix that then there was some feedback from female black employees that they were getting lots of negative comments about their hair particularly around it being braided or if it was a natural afro style from people say, who didn't understand it said your you know, hair looks x y and z um so first of all we made an unequivocal statement that that kind of behavior was absolutely unacceptable um and that's not how we rolled in Foxtons. we don't want that kind of behavior here and did an education piece around natural afro hair is, is more than acceptable and shouldn't be commented on and so no other hairstyle should be either and secondly quite interestingly dom is a clever guy and he knows what his what works for his community he engaged with the number one hairdresser for natural Afro hair, Charlotte Menser, and I'm sure some people on the call will have heard of her. She's often name checked in Vogue and Tatler. She's in the Afro hairdresser hall of fame. I mean, she's really, really well known uh, for, for natural Afro hairstyles. Um, she's she's a super super hair celebrity, you know, which I think is quite cool. So Dom organised for her to come in and do um, a session for 20 of our employees to, to say, look, it's you know, it's you've got an hour to get ready for work. You're ironing a shirt. You're racing out the door what's a natural Afro hairstyle you can wear that looks fabulous and professional? What does that look like? Um, so we, we ran that event because it was kind of saying, this is important to us. It's important to us as a business that we take this seriously. We're going to have a great event for Afro Foxtons, but also make it all about authenticity. If you want to wear your hair in a natural Afro style, you can do that. If you don't want to, that's also fine too. This is about choice, but we're going to throw a weight behind an event to say, we are giving everyone the opportunity to have this choice and managers should need to Get behind that very quickly so it's an example of actually sometimes having those difficult situations that you respond to people are looking to you to see how you react great um 
you know, you talked about the culture of the, the organization and, the, and there's, you know, there's obvious that um, a, 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 the nature of the, of, of the business that you're in, you know, Foxton's is a, is a close knit culture, a, a work hard, play hard culture with, you know, many long serving folk who've been there throughout. Um, you know, the obvious challenge then is how, do, how comfortable are people speaking up when things don't feel right? Um, and, you know, so have you seen sort of a, an improvement in that? Have you seen people more confident about, about calling things out? Have you seen, um, and there's a question from Harriet here about, uh, you know, any trends in, around people giving feedback anonymously or, were, you know, were people happy to come forward and share their, uh, and share their names in any event? Well, they've got, they've got the way to give it anon anonymously anyway through the survey. Our, our engagement survey is done through Willis Towers, Watson, All Independent. Um, however, um, most people, my understanding is, they seem pretty comfortable to give it. Um, but they don't need to be anonymous. And I know, I know that because I've heard the feedback coming through. So we get very punchy feedback through um, without, without it being a problem. You know, they, they'll literally, our employees will literally just pick up the phone and speak to one of their community chairs. And give the feedback really quickly um and we hear all we hear all, all sorts so recently actually uh, we knew we kind of we knew we were getting the right level of feedback through what we had a few employees complain about black lives matter um we made the decision wrongly actually we made the decision not to um do a, so a black square on social media on our instagram account because we felt that was really reductive we saw lots of companies doing the black square on their instagram account for black lives matter that we knew weren't diverse employers we thought it was just really um corporate you know corporate wallpaper and really inauthentic so we decided that wasn't for us but a load of employees come forward and say what are you doing then if you're not doing that what are you doing because it looks like you don't care um, and that was a bit of a lesson to us saying well we just made a decision on it and we shouldn't have done that we should have asked you what you wanted us to do um, and had a lot of, lot of open conversations about it and what was the most authentic thing for us was our CEO to write a blog about his experiences and why it was important to him and what he was doing about it and that felt you, for, for a start you've got a lot of um words in a blog you can actually really explain the position quite clearly you can invite feedback and it's way more effective than an instagram post so yes we do get feedback with people telling us they disagree with what we're doing that is absolutely fine and we will listen and do something about it well I, you know and i'm not sure it was the wrong answer to to you know join the herd i think there were there were large numbers of organizations that put out some fairly meaningless and empty expressions of alignment uh, uh, at, at the time without any um, uh, you know concrete evidence that there was there was action behind it and I think and I think um, and, and you know some of them have been rightly called out for that um, I, you know it is the right thing to listen and, and respond um, and I think that sounds like a very thoughtful and appropriate response I mean what to what extent are you seeing you know the, tr the the trend sort of accelerated through you know the extra lens of your networks the, you know the trend for two things i think um f you know firstly for organizations to um take a, a a lead on wider events in society and secondly for and related for you know um colleagues wanting to be able to have discussions at work about the things that are bothering them in society, whether they directly relate to the, to the, or to the company or not. So, you know, much broader than the sort of traditional workplace um, discussions. H how much of that are you seeing? I think that, that, that changed a long time ago, I think, in my world. I think in the world of HR, engagement, whilst engagement is a difficult term, psychologists really dislike the word engagement. Job satisfaction is a more proven measure and engagement is often hard, hard to define or there's no standard definition of it. But engagement has been around for a long time. And that's simply, if you think about it, finding out if people enjoy working in your workplace and what's their view of it and, and feedback on how you're responding to events. I think if we go back, dial, dial back, sometimes the Frederick Taylor style of management, so Taylorism, where you had factories and the, the bosses would control the factories, the workers would just have to shut up and like it because they owned the capital, they got to dictate how the jobs were run. You know, fast forward to the 80s, 90s and today, knowledge workers, people who have intellectual capital, 
suddenly have an opinion and you can't lock up your factory every night you can't lock your employees away that knowledge walks out of the door every night at you know five six o'clock in the evening so if you want to make, you know hang on to that intellectual capital the client relationships the knowledge they have you've got to engage them you know you, you've got to have this relationship with employees that they're happy to show up otherwise they'll just go and work somewhere else they don't have to be tied to a, a factory anymore we're not on the Fred, frederick taylor command and control school of management anymore so there, ha there has to be this dialogue with it with employees and that will include external events me too was a really big one that that was a really big topic for debate and that was very heated on you know on, on many levels black lives matter you know these things will happen all the time i think you, you shouldn't be on the back foot or be worried about them you just need to have a conversation about it and I, perhaps i can link a, a, a couple of a couple of questions um you know one one, one from amrit and one from joanna um you know obviously there's only so much you know there's, there's plenty you can do to create the right culture and atmosphere of one of um appreciation and respect internally but you've got a very customer focused um uh organization of, often dealing with people in a fairly high stress um uh and environment as well you know how do you manage um some of the biases and microaggressions on behalf of customers and you know a related point you know m allowing people to be comfortable at, and their true selves at, at, at work um you know sometimes involves wearing um traditional cultural attire that would be appropriate that um you know that that uh, wrongly, of course, some of your customers might not particularly warm to. So, how do you deal with those, you know those those challenges of of trying to ensure that um, your staff are are, are treated this, um, with the same respect by your customers, where you can't control that? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Interesting one. We don't we don't get too many cases of it. Weirdly, I don't know why that is. Um, potentially because. When people come in, they've got a, they've got a quite a clear purpose, and they they're quite invested in probably having a good relationship with their estate agents. So they show them nice properties, I guess. I don't know why, but we don't we don't. I cert I certainly don't hear of too many examples of it. We do get occasions of customers being difficult or rude. I agree. Um, I think the first thing we do is try and make sure our staff are behaving in a way that doesn't provoke it. Because I think often staff being difficult or rude can provoke a hostile response back. So part of it is how you you start off. So for instance, we had a speaker recently, Dr. Jane Hamlin, and she was speaking um, on behalf of the trans community saying, you know, you need to make sure that um, you know how to address people. Even simple things like asking people how they want to be addressed is really key. So getting off on the right foot is quite important. But then we do lots of work with our staff around handling difficult conversations, you know, how they do their day-to-day -day jobs, plenty of training. We also quite, quite unusually have um, a digital coaching platform that we've embedded throughout our organization. So anything like that would bubble up in these coaching conversations. It's a great tool called Open Blend. It means that we look at the wheel of life and grow model coaching with all our staff. All our managers use it and it kind of holds their hand through a good coaching conversation with their teams. So all of our staff, for instance, map out what's important to them. Is it family life? Is it career? Is it is it fun? You know, what does that look, is it health? Um, and, and every quarter they're having those conversations with their managers and it gives staff an opportunity to bring these things up and get coached on them. So if things were happening, there's definitely development opportunities to help that. We, we've had, um, there's a couple of questions here around, uh, uh, you know, around disability um, and around some of the, you know, the other uh, dimensions of diversity that are, uh, you know that are harder to, to tackle and that you know other organizations have uh, um, you know have networks so disability um, networks are quite prevalent in other organizations um, uh, in, in you know, an organization that, that that I'm on the board of you know there is there's a carer network as well to reflect the challenges of juggling um, uh, job and caring responsibilities and ensure that there's appropriate workplace flexibility there. Um, you know, some of these, so you, you, you know, you signal that um, dis that uh, disability and a continued focus on social mobility, um, you know, continued priorities for them, but some of those sound sound harder. So, so yeah. you know, 
um, in the same way that you you can hopefully offer um, some encouragement to people who are early at an earlier stage on this that they should just jump in. How are you going to jump in on some of those things, which also perhaps raise some which raise some more practical issues for you and the nature of the of the business as well? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm. I'm really interested in doing more on the disability piece, a bit like uh, some of the community heads we've mentioned are active members of communities. I had a friend of mine who was very, I mentioned her earlier on, Martine Wright, the Paralympian, was very badly injured actually in 7-7 and lost both her legs. And for the first time, it's obviously going back, you know, what's it, 12 years now, it, it really highlighted me at the time. God, being in a wheelchair is super, is super difficult. And there's this huge world I'd never seen before around problems with mobility and accessibility, which simply I just bypassed me because I wasn't in that world. I wasn't aware of it. And I suddenly was very, very aware of it. And I'm aware that disability also isn't just wheelchairs. It's a huge, big, broad range of, of non-visible disabilities as well as the visible ones. But that's, that's something that I would like to chair, kind of head that piece of work up. It's important to me to do. Disability is an interesting one. I've been trying to get my head around it as to where we go with it. It seems very much different from the other communities. What you don't necessarily do is set a group up. You don't have to have a group for things. It's more about your recruitment and your policies. And that's really driving change through. Are we set up in the right way? Are we an accessible workplace? Have we got policies that make it an inclusive workplace for disabled people? And how are we gonna do that? And then how do we recruit a diverse workforce and then make sure that they're not just not coming here. They don't see us as not an op op option for a place to work. So we've definitely got some work to do there around accessibility, the recruitment and the policies behind it um, and that's definitely up next on my list and of course you know the, the the some of the challenges around some of these extra dimensions of, of diversity disability um uh you know they're not always visible um, yeah. um I, you know carers you, you, you we probably don't know um whether most of our colleagues have caring responsibility or not and it's sometimes quite a revelation when you when when you find that out um so you know have you found there are there are external organizations that can help bring perspective into the discussions and help inform the discussions of the way forward is there anyone that that you've that you would um that, that you're planning to, to to work with or that you've worked with that you would you would uh, endorse for for this audience there's no on, one to, on anything so far. No, no, that's a good, that's a good point. Time. On the disability one, we are currently currently considering a couple um, because I think it's one of those areas where we're going to definitely need expert help from someone because it's not something we're expert at ourselves. So we need to get some input there. Um, other other organisations, like I say, Career Ready have been brilliant with us, partnering with them on social mobility to help us look at internships. The youth group is brilliant when it looks at you know how do we support more young people into work, which I think has been key. And Albright is a brilliant partnership around, you know, getting great content for, for your female employees. There's there's such a plethora and a range of, of partners out there. It just depends on what's right for your business context. But there's no shortage of options. It depends on budget, depends on appetite, depends on need. But there's definitely a partner out there. Um, you, you know, you talked about uh, um, measurement as you as, as you went through you know what are you finding amongst the sort of wide range of stakeholders that are interested in what you're doing you know your, your, your shareholders your, your 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 customers your your um, colleagues in the workplace uh, you know what aspects of this are, the, are each of those different groups um, uh, particularly keen on and and are you able to measure the things that that people are looking for Customers is an interesting one. We, we measure, like everyone, customer feedback through Trustpilot. Um, and we'll know if, people, if we're doing a good job through what people say about their service. People can easily measure our diversity, if not our inclusion. They can measure our diversity through simply looking through one of the glass windows in a Boxton branch and see the kind of people we have working there. We've got a very, very noticeably diverse workforce in a way that is uncommon for estate agents. So I think that comes across quite loud and clear. Um, anyone who's working with Foxtons or, or dealing with Foxtons as a customer, our, our stakeholders, other shareholders or investors, people are always very surprised at how diverse we are, actually. You know, when they hear that we've got, you know, high high amounts of fame and an almost equal female male split and a you know thriving and kind of very active lgbtq plus community they're, they're always a bit surprised by that because like i say a state agency is known to be a bit traditional a little bit old school um maybe a bit um 
focus more on, on white and male. Um, and so we have a very, very unusually diverse workforce for our industry. So the feedback we tend to get is, really, are you? Are you diverse? I go, yeah, we're, we are diverse. And that's that's very surprising to lots of people, which means I need to do a better job of talking about it more. And our employer brand needs to, to mirror that a little bit better because we just take it for granted and we forget that other people don't. But there's one specific question here, which might just be a sort of yes, no. There's diff obviously a lot of noise out there around whether unconscious bias training um, was actually helpful or unhelpful in, in emphasize, you know, unhelpful in emphasizing differences, helpful in, in, uh, in increasing levels of understanding. The, the kind of jury's out. For, for many organisations, although you know, I think the you know the tide has the tide has turned against that. I, I would I would largely suggest. Well, you know, what's 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 your organisation's experience, and and you know, also can you go on and say, well, what have you found really useful? You know, what, what what's the training and interventions that that have really been impactful for you? The most the most important impactful training on unconscious bias training for us is is we get people in a room and we talk about first of all we give people permission to be biased and say it's part of human evolution you're designed to be actually biased and chunk people up into groups so don't worry it doesn't mean if it doesn't necessarily mean the same as bigoted bias is actually hardwired but we just need to be aware of those biases which kind of people are always worried about being seen to be a negative you have to go it's okay it's okay you're gonna have some biases but you need to be open and open about them and secondly what we do with bias training here is we don't just look at the the protected characteristics you know gender age ethnicity we th we see bias in all types of um manner whether someone for instance you know wears a certain suit and tie or whether someone's shoe color you can see bias around the way someone speaks you can see bias around their school background i think bias is huge actually and really gets in the way of good hiring so we have a very very um provocative quite humorous session on that around actually let's be honest with ourselves what do we like and dislike about people that we see at interview stage or when we hire people and it's not just actually around the protected characteristics it's more around Around, you know the way the CV looks or the way um, they dress or the school they went to it, it's so difficult sometimes people get stuck on this stuff so you just have to kind of highlight it and go that is a bit ridiculous that you're basing someone's ability to shake your hand in a firm way or they have shiny shoes that you're going to give them a job based on that I mean that's a bit crazy but how many times have you heard that I like shiny shoes interview and a firm handshake so we kind of we look at bias there's more than just you know, that the protected characteristics are more about let's look at some of the other, you know, nonsensical views you might have on what a good candidate looks like. And that does actually get people thinking differently a little bit. You're grinning, Mark. I'm guessing you've heard the shiny shoes and firm handshake one before, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we're nearly out of time. So one quick question. It's one where I think, we, you know, we have, a, we have an organisational view as the, the, the IBE. It's about targets, and um, you know, you know the, the the value of setting numerical targets or, 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 or quotas. Or I think we kind of moved away from quotas, but um, uh, you know, and I should sort of interject at the beginning. You know, the RB, our view is you need targets because targets are a measure of progress, but they're not the goal. And, and I, I wonder, you know, what what your view on on, on targets is? I think they can be helpful as long as they're not a reductive quota. I think they can be helpful in a way. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you've got the target versus quota debate. I think if I'm honest, as a PLC, it's unavoidable for us because we have governance um, code of conduct to keep in, in, in line with and shareholders will vote against people who don't fit in with those quotas. So institutional shareholder societies will automatically red top or, or block votes when it comes to AGMs with companies that don't have the right diversity initiatives in place. So for us as a PLC, we're regularly, that's front of mind you know, all the time because otherwise it'll impact on our, our shareholders. They'll have, a, they'll have a very strong view on it. So whether we like it or not, targets are, are really important to lots of people and we need to consider them. Yeah. That makes sense. I think, unfortunately, with that, we're, we're, we're kind of um, out of time. I mean, it's interesting to reflect on the, um, you know, on the scores we heard earlier on uh, from our little uh, straw poll, where I think we, we, we still saw, um, you know, a reasonable level of confidence of understanding the difference between uh, diversity and inclusion, but I think more confidence that 
organizations are on board for the diversity part of it than, um, than the inclusion part of it. Um, you know, Sarah, it's been tremendous to hear for you to come and join and us today and to share the journey that your business has, has been on, on both diversity and inclusion and some of the practical steps that you've taken to create a truly uh, inclusive culture. Um, you know, one where um, everyone's comfortable being their true self and everyone has an equal opportunity to, to be their best. Um, I think it's, you know, it's shown the importance of leadership. It's shown the importance of making sure that it's everyone's responsibility, not parked um, to the side, that it's a core part of the business and integrated into everything that, that, that you do, but also why leadership and turn from the top is, uh, um, uh, is essential. And also, you know, discussion at the end on, uh, you know, on targets, this is not a compliance exercise. You're not gonna get beyond diversity and beyond representation and actually allow people to have their voice unless, um, unless you, you have a, a solid inclusion um, element to your, to your program. So look, thanks again. Um, and uh, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there's much more that we could have talked about, but thanks very much for, for all your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So quickly before we go, just a um, uh, just a reminder that you know the slides will be available and, the, and a recording of the webinar will be available on our website uh, in the next uh, day or so. Um, and to flag quickly some upcoming events for those involved. There's a Ben meeting coming up, uh, but in terms of our public events, the IBE summer lecture will be on Wednesday, the 14th of July, and we are delighted that this year our our speaker will be Sir, Sir, Sir John Thompson, uh, Chief Executive of the FRC. Um, there is still time just to sign up for our next training session this coming Monday, uh, 21st of June, on embedding business ethics. Uh, in an interactive session, Chris and Gwen will tell you everything you need to know about how to operate an effective ethics program. Um, and on, 20, on the 22nd of July, our director Ian Peters will lead a masterclass for future business leaders on ethical leadership. Um, you can still take advantage of early bird rates for that one. And details of all of those are available on our website. Um, and finally, please do stay on to complete the survey that will follow your feedback helps us shape future events. So have a great afternoon. Goodbye.